very, very happy. We're also honored to have you on the African Health Student Summit today. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Our next panelist is um, we like an iron lady. She comes from the University of Zambia, where she is a lecturer and a researcher in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health. She is a social epidemiologist and a public health specialist with a nursing background. She completed her PhD in public health from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa and her master's degree in public health from the University of Otago in New Zealand. She is a researcher with interest in maternal, newborn, child health, and adolescent health, involving various aspects of access and rights particularly for rural, poorest women and the vulnerables. She would like to explore ethical challenges and issues within the broader context of operational and health system research, bringing in ethical dilemmas surrounding the poorest and most vulnerable women and adolescents in Zambia and Africa at large. Please join me as we welcome this outstanding scholar, Dr. Colwil Jacobs. I pray I pronounce that well. Dr. Jacobs, please, are you with us? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, that's the correct Cholwe Jacobs. Thank you. Cholwe. <laughs> yeah. Thank Dr. you Jacobs. so much for the correction. Okay. Now we move on to our next very, 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 very lovely panelist. We are talking of a social legal researcher who is a feminist and equally, and she's also an equality expert. She has keen interest in regional and international obligations, sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender and disability issues. These are basically the vulnerables. She has authored various articles and reports on the role of national human rights institutions in promoting compliance with international obligations, grassroots women organizing for change, the right to legal capacity of persons and disabilities, persons with disabilities, sorry. She has also advocated for rights to education and has contributed to various research on rights of women and submissions to the African Union and United Nations human rights bodies. She is currently the advocacy advisor for, the, for Africa at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Can we please welcome our legal expert, the um, senior advisor for at the Center of Reproductive Rights, Ms. Mariam Utenje. Please, are you with us? Good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon. It's evening in my time zone. Thank you so much for having me. You are most welcome. And uh, as we say, we always want to introduce the beautiful ones as the fourth. However, I would want to introduce not just a beautiful lady with very, very intelligent brains, but also the co-executive of UHIA, the East African Sexual Health and Rights Initiative. Africa's first indigenous activist found for and by sexual and gender minorities, as well as sex workers which support civil society organizing across seven Eastern African countries and Pan-African organizations, addressing poverty, violence, and ensuring their education, et cetera, et cetera. While well, we're dealing with someone who considers sexual minorities, I think, and, and, and uh, sexual workers, I, I feel this is a very important aspect of Africa we often overlook in sexual and reproductive rights. Now, she is a health professional with extensive international and domestic experience with foreign government agencies and private donors. Her expertise is in my monitoring and appraising public global health programs, effectiveness and strategic development as programming. She's an expert in sexual reproductive health and rights, health development, and influencing laws, policies, and programs beyond Kenya. Her leadership positions include board members, of the funders concerned about HIV and AIDS. 
She is also currently pursuing a law degree. This is whoa. Can you please join me as I welcome Dr. Stella Busiri? Dr. Stella, are we here? Hi, I I've just joined in. I've been having challenges with the internet. I am by the coast. I came in for the National Reproductive Health Network um, conference. And I'm so sorry that I have missed, I think, the best part of the conversation around introduction. However, I am here. Thank you so much for having me around. You are most welcome, Dr. Stella. We are still in the introduction. <laughs> so I want to introduce he who is the blessed one amongst the women, who is 25-year-old, very, very, very zealous youth developer development advocate from Durban in South Africa. His advocacy focuses in youth development context and are in the areas of sexual reproductive health and rights. Comprehensive sexual education, HIV prevention, climate change, environmental stabilities, and youth participation and involvement with the SDGs. The African Union Agenda 2063, United Nations Secretary General Global Strategy on Women, Children and Adolescents held since 2015 to 2030, an international conference on population and development beyond 2014. Two, he serves as a regional youth advisor to the United Nations Population Fund, a national focal point on global youth coalition on AIDS, HIV, and has since been appointed as the national focal point for the 2030 campaign. In 2016, he chaired the Durban Youth Force, the official platform for the youth engagement at International Aid Conference. Please join me as we welcome the outstanding Levi Singh. Mr. Levi, please are you with us? I am. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and uh, greetings to the rest of the fabulous panel. Looking forward to an incredibly enlightening and robust discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, and introducing our, um, will I say, our red damsel, the outstanding first female president of the International Federation of Medical Students Association, IFMSA, who has also gone further to move mountains in um, other spheres of global health, especially women health, gender equity, and sexual reproductive health and rights. We are talking of someone who is a passionate advocate for gender equality in global health and a leading voice in the moment to correct the gender imbalance in global health leadership. She is also a practicing internal medicine physician in Washington, D.C. She is particularly committed to addressing issues of power privilege and intersectional and intersectionality that keep many women from global health leadership roles to opening up spaces for the voices of these women to be heard. She's determined to build a movement to transform women's leadership opportunity in health. She's the co-founder of Women in Global Health in 2015. Today, Women in Global Health has more than 24 plus chapters and 3,000 and 35,000 supporters in more than 90 countries and continues to grow. She advises the WHO on matters of health, workforce, gender equity, universal health coverage, and has, rec and has been recognized in the gender equality top 100 the most influential people in global policy 2019. Let's welcome, like I said, our first president of IFMSA, who was female, Dr. Ropa Dat. Great, thank you so much for the warm um, welcome, Otobo. And I am just delighted to be here with all of you and uh, looking forward to our discussions. I'm looking forward to our discussion too. So, uh, I uh, welcomed our very, very wonderful panelists. And uh, don't forget, if you have questions, you can ask them in the question box. We will take questions after the session. Now, uh, the objective of this session is to understand the current stand on African sexual reproductive health and rights, which to a large extent involves gender equity. 
to empower healthcare students to become champions of SRH R in Africa, to enable healthcare students understand that there is a promising role for them in SRH R, and their promising role is fulfilled who the very, very strong promise for Africa, and to establish the health and rights of the LGBTQ community in Africa. I know this is a very, very, very controversial topic, uh, but we're going to discuss it. Now, uh, with a kindly call on our panelists, I'll call them one by one, to give a five minute introduction uh, about themselves and their organization. And during their five minutes introduction, they will tell us what SRHR means to them, what the what would they rate the current African skill on sexual reproductive health and rights on a scale from one to 10? Are we at 10, outstanding, or are we at one, very poor? The, what are the main goals of your organization and association in, prom in promoting SRHR? And what are the two major obstacles you see as regards Africa attaining at least 90% accuracy in sexual reproductive health and rights? Each speaker, please, would have five minutes to discuss, introduce the organizations themselves and discuss these um, four preambic questions. So I would like to start with Dr. Stella Busiri. Dr. Stella, good afternoon, please. Um, thank you so much for this um, amazing, amazing opportunity. So perhaps I'll start by just speaking about who we are as an institution and what it is that we do um, as, as an organization. Um, so Uhai Yashri was, is an institution that was founded about 10 years ago. And what Uhai Yashri does is that it supports civil society movements within the Eastern or the East, the Eastern African regions, CSO that work around the intersection of, um, of, of, of sexuality, gender, human rights, housing, adequate um, nutrition around Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, we have been in existence for the last 10 years. Um, this is actually our 11th year in existence. What we do is that we, we are a radical organization that is led by activists, meaning that the people who are leading this organization are drawn from the movement are people who understand what it is around um, sexual and gender minorities, sex worker, adolescent, young women who are either identify or do not identify but are part of the vulnerable populations. For me, every time I hear the word SRHR, one of the things that usually comes into my mind is the nuancing around, around inclusivity. If you look at our programming within the African continent, it has actually been programmed from a dichotomous perspective, which is male, female, um, women, and uh, men and women. So for me, I always nuance around an inclusivity and a diversity perspective, speaking about sexual health just being not just as is, is a state of physical, mental, and social well-being in terms of sexuality, speaking about sexual rights, ability to be able to decide on one's own sexuality, who you're attracted to how it is that you present your gender, and also around reproductive health, ensuring a complete reproductive system and healthy pregnancies and access to healthcare and medication and education for those who are women in the mainstream in terms of binary women, heterosexual women rather, in terms of um, um, lesbian, bisexual, queer women, gender non-conforming women, and finally just speaking about rights. So for me, that is usually one of the nuances I usually bring on the table because it's not a nuance, particularly within the African continent, in the context where there's criminalization of, criminalization of same-sex relationship that really happens. Our goal of the organization, we are game changers in terms of being disruptive. We currently move the highest amount of funding. I am the co-executive director. We move the highest amount of funding within the African continent, continent to be able to ensure the sexual and gender minorities, sex workers, people who identify as a, other forms of vulnerable populations are able to have the highest form of reproductive health among other needs that we are able to support. Two major obstacles that Africa face in attaining 90% accuracy around SRHR, of course it's about, I mean, the biggest thing around 
around identity and orientation usually speak around public discourse, speak around legal issues, speak around policy, legal and policy issues, speak around um, 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 lived realities, speak around organizational issues, around movement building. So for the African continent, it's indeed aside from South Africa and a few African select countries, we still have criminalization of same-sex relationship. But in some countries, particularly, in the, for example, in the Eastern African region, jurisdictions like Tanzania, they actually have punitive uh, measures around criminalization of, criminalization of same-sex sex relationship that people get up to life sentences in terms of jail. In Kenya, the maximum sentence is up to 14 years. In Uganda, we saw the introduction of anti-homosexual bill. All these are bills which are, which are meant to one, policy uh, human bodies, deprive human bodies of their own pleasures, measure, measure human bodies in terms of their access to reproductive health, among other healthcare needs. Remember, reproductive health is an intersectionality. In fact, you can actually do a nexus between reproductive health to one, I, I mean, a connection within poverty, a connection to adequate housing, a connection to, 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 to dignified housing, a connection to adequate um, nutrition, a connection to, to reliable cities. And, and I, mean, I mean, here I'm already speaking about SDGs, a connection to gender equality. So that's one of the nexus that we've never been able to be able to draw because of the criminalization that exists. However, we have a we have a green opportunity to be able to change this narrative. We have an opportunity, particularly around young people. Remember, WHO literally um, from ICD-11 removed from the classification of transgender, um, of the, the, de actually declassified the gender dysphoric diseases, meaning that sexual orientation and gender identity is no longer pathologized. So for us as people who are trained as medics, for us as people who are in advocacy, our question is to be able to ask ourselves, what is our role? What is our role in able to ensure that each and every young person within the African continent, each and every person who passes through any healthcare worker can be able to access healthcare that is dignified, devoid of stigma and discrimination and of the highest quality. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Stella Busiri. Uh, please, to our lovely speakers as you um, speak, um, as you are speaking, uh, please turn on your videos. Uh, so that our lovely delegates can see you, please. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Dagi, uh, can you kindly please introduce yourself? Um, you already been introduced, the amazing Dr. Dagi, but please tell us what SRHR is to you. And is Africa a one or Africa is a thing currently in SRHR? And what does Sheba do? Uh, okay, so I think uh, sexual and reproductive holding rights. I um, mean a lot of different things for people coming from uh, different cultural backgrounds, having different values, having different attitudes. So um, I live in Ethiopia. So I'm, I'm going to tell you from the personal experience that I have and what um, actually sexual and reproductive holding rights means to me. So I come from Ethiopia. That means um, we have a female president and we also have a half court parliament uh, being led by women. Okay. So um, what we do with our project, Sexual Health Education for Better Awareness, is we go to the rural sites and teach. Uh, it's a pro it's actually a project that um, seeks to ensure all you living in a rural site have access to sexual health education. So something that we um, understood is um, the fact that um, this this having female president and the fact that having half of our parliament being women um, is kind of inspiring to us to the people that are living in a city but when you come to the reality and when you, when you go to the rural sites where uh youth is not um having access to you know um internet having access to um tvs or not having access to the information um it's actually um something that we have to work on so this is this is where i get the sense of sexual and reproductive holding rights and if you ask me where um i put africa um, African continent as a whole on a scale of one to 10, um, we live in a society where um, even discussing about gender equality is a problem or is um, it's difficult by itself, okay? So um, I think we need to be able to first admit the existence of sexual and reproductive health. I think we need to be able to first admit it as a problem then we'll be able to um, scale it from one to 10. Otherwise, currently, we're way, 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 way 
far from um, working because now, right now, we're working on awareness creation. I mean, we have a lot of things. We have a lot of things to do uh, before we put um, Africa on the scale of one to ten. So um, I'm going to give it a very big number, but that's going to be um, um, negative. I'm seeing uh, hands raised. So if you have any question, I think you can um, write it on the chat box, and then uh, after we finish it, I'm going to answer. So yeah. So yeah, this is what it means to me. Thank you so very much, Dr. Dagi. Wow, Africa is, uh, I don't know, on a scale of one to 10, we got a negative. Uh, a very, very important point Dr. Busiri raised was the uh, criminalization of uh, LGBTQ communities and same-sex marriages in Africa. And if we feel we are doing this because of morality, we also look at the fact that women are usually suppressed, oppressed, and made to suffer. So there is no gender equity in Africa. Ethiopia has a female president. Uh, as much as I would like to applaud that, uh, we, we still don't have 100% sexual reproductive health and rights practice there. And now to our amazing Dr. Rupa Das, the CEO, Women for Global Health. Dr. Rupa, please, can you take the floor? Great, thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, well, I just wanted to uh, first kick off and share a little bit about women in global health. Uh, yeah, you provided a great introduction, uh, but for many of you that do not know about women in global health, we are a global movement, uh, really uh, striving to achieve gender equality and global health leadership. We were founded in um, 2015 and I'm one of the co-founders, very much inspired um, uh, as a student leader to then go on and take a little bit of break to do clinical training and then um, co-create uh, the global movement, which now does have 24 chapters, really fortunate to be joined with one of our co-founders from our Zambia chapter, Dr. Um, Chole Jacobs, who you'll, you'll be hearing from. But some of the things that we're doing at Women in Global Health, when it really comes to how we intersect with the SRHR, the, the Sexually Reproductive Health Rights uh, Agenda, is very much around making sure that we approach it from a gender, gender uh, responsive way and transformative way. Um, so we know that uh, right now when we take a look at um, the global health and particularly the health sector, 70% uh, of the health and social workforce are women. But when you take a look at senior leadership roles, those numbers quickly dwindle down to 25%. Uh, when we actually break that down regionally and uh, contextualizing it in uh, how leadership looks like in the continent of Africa, one of the great things that we have seen over the last few years is that there is um, a, you know, increased amount of political commitment to have cabinet um, under a head of government which have gender parity commitments. So governments like Ethiopia have announced that Rwanda has obviously been one that's been known. Uh, but when you look at the ministers of health number numbers, um, Africa tends to be around um, hanging around the 30%. And that actually compared to the rest of the world is a bit better. So from a representation side, we see um, that there is a lot of leadership and a lot of learnings from the continent. Yet if you break that down, as, as we know that the SDGs agenda has taught us is that we can't look at things from an aggregated per perspective. We can't look at things as, um, as numbers just um, you know, uh, in one pool. We need to break it down uh, from a national, subnational with an intersectionality lens. And all those things really show us that the realities vary significantly across the continent, depending on which country, whether it is a Francophone, Lusophone um, uh, country, um, and really even then in the key decision-making that is happening within the health sector, women continue to be left um, out of decision-making. And that clearly has an impact on the uh, advancement of sexual reproductive health and rights, because we know that when women um, are at the decision-making table, they are going to bring that perspective of uh, a woman's perspective. They might not always be gender transformative, but that women's perspective is really critical to putting the issues that matter to uh, many women, which are around um, maternal, neonatal um, child health, but we know it's much more than that. And I was really delighted to hear one of our um, colleagues just earlier really say it's also about um, females' entire sexual health, and that includes sexual pleasure as well. And we don't often um, create opportunities to talk about those taboo topics, and that, that continues to be um, very much related to the fact that women are not at the decision-making table. Um, some other numbers that I'd like to share with, with everybody is that uh, when we did a map 
mapping of women's representation in COVID-19, um, looking at national task teams uh, over 87 different countries around the world. Um, what we found is that uh, these are political appointments to be on a national task team to respond to COVID-19, but 85% of those task teams were majority men and uh, less than 5% actually had gender parity. And that's something that we're seeing those numbers even in a continent such as Africa where there has been some strong prominent women's leadership um, and that there are examples of women being um, leaders in health um, and in um, ministries of health and the numbers are looking better than some other regions. But when it comes to those decision making such as this pandemic, women are on the continent being um, left out of that. And that really does have implications. And Daniel, you challenged us to really you know, ask um, ourselves some key questions on you know, rating how, how are things um, going in, in Africa. I feel I'm not the most um, well positioned as an outsider from the continent to, to do that rating, but I always see that gender equality is a, a journey, and we always have to, you know, rate lower than than <laughs> than higher because there's always so much more work to be done. Current estimates show us that gender equality is going to take at least a hundred years, if not two hundred years, to achieve. And when it comes to the health aspect, um, we need to think about gender equality and health. Um, really, um, of course, the women's health agenda, but also the comprehensive uh, sexual reproductive health uh, and rights agenda, which applies to all. Gender genders and really make this an issue for all genders. Uh, the second thing is looking at the health sector, um, not only from the people that are, uh, you know, accessing health services, but also the people that are delivering those health services. How equal are we? We know that health workers in the sector, um, there is a gender disparity when it comes to leadership. But even when you look at issues such as the pay gap, um, the health sector is one of the widest pay gaps. It's about 29% percent um, between men and women and half of what women do in the health sector is in unpaid or informal work which amounts to 1.5 trillion US dollars annually equivalent to the GDP of Australia so money in uh, financing and investing in our health workers um, really continues to be an issue and that also impacts um, the sexually productive health and rights because if we're asking these health workers to work for free not be paid or work in a stipend way for uh, nine months to 12 months, um, how can we expect them to provide the sexual uh, reproductive health um, uh, services that, that everyone depends on? And we know that so much of our health systems are uh, subsidized by the poorest women. So definitely moving forward, I'd encourage us um, in every continent around the world to really look at not only um, the, the access issues, um, but really bring the agenda of who's providing these, um, these services. And then finally, I'd like to say that, you know, the, uh, the other aspect of is how do we make this a gender responsive approach? Um, too often the sexual reproductive health rights is uh, lumped together as part of just women's rights, while there is a core aspect of it being part of women's rights and um, and definitely having bodily autonomy um, and the decision to choose over one's body being a top priority for women, we need to see this as everyone's business and everyone's rights and everyone benefits when there is a gender responsive health system. And um, we're delighted to hear much more commitment. Um, last year at the high level political meeting on universal health coverage that took place in um, New York uh, City, uh, um, at the UN, governments came together and made a very strong commitment um, to making sure that uh, none of us um, end up into financial hardships because of health issues, and that every country does have to respond to achieving universal health coverage. And that's a really important agenda in the Africa continent. And we also know that that document is one of the most gender responsive um, mainstream documents in health. Of course, as health rights and sexual reproductive health rights advocates, we feel like it's not strong enough. But for us, um, you know, right now we are facing a true battle. There is a active pushback. There's an active rollback. And I encourage all of you to really look at what is your government's positions been on sexually protective health and rights. We know that the global gag rule um, that went into place by the US government um, has uh, really dismantled a lot of the, the infrastructure. We also know that there has been um, strong handling by the US uh, administration to bring a lot of countries that were moving on a progressive route to uh, regress and to actually um, make public 
public stances against uh, the women rights and gender equality rights agenda. So there's there's a lot that that has been um, actively there's progress being made in some places, but there's also an active undermining. And um, know that there are global agreements that governments have made on this, and we're not asking for new commitments to be made. We're making we're really asking for that that current commitments don't get rolled back. And so please um, tune into those kind of discussions. Use those political declarations to ask for accountability at the national level. And we know that you know countries in the Africa continent are being very much pressured by um, stronghold or uh, strongholding governments like the U.S. Um, and that is problematic. Uh, I'm very hopeful that's going to change very quickly with the new administration um, I'm going to take a different stance. But as you know, um, once the seeds of rolling back have been planted, it, it's it's a it is a up, uh, uphill battle. So I'm really delighted that you, that this particular group of students is putting this um, uh, dialogue together because we have a lot to um, to take on and uh, consider women in global health as one of your allies where we have so many different chapters forming in the African continent. If we don't have a chapter in your, in your country and you'd like to start one, please get in touch. And uh, Dr. Chole Jacobs, who you'll be hearing from shortly is a great example of how um, we really try to create platforms that are locally driven, connected globally, um, and really going um, in a sort of collective action at all different levels to drive the gender equality agenda, which of course includes uh, sexual reproductive health and rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupadat. That was so much to take in that very, very, very significant hosting news. Uh, the 85% of the COVID workforce in about 87 countries were men. Uh, that these, does, do this involve African countries? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Daniel, I, I missed the, the last part you said. Um, do you mind repeating that? I just, it was breaking up for me. Okay, I said uh, the study on 85% uh, of the COVID workforce being men, do, do, did this study involve African countries or just uh, the Americans? Yes, it does. It does involve um, uh, uh, African countries. It was 87 countries around the world um, that we looked at, and uh, particularly in the Africa continent, there were some examples where um, there were uh, actually uh, some task teams that even had all men um, on it. And so I think that's been problematic. And um, we, uh, you know, Globally, the numbers were just terrible. I mean, the United States first task team had zero women out of uh, 20 and their numbers are only 7%. So we see this as a global issue as much as a, a um, sub-regional sub issue. We also had challenges getting the data and I'm sure this has been covered in other sessions in greater detail, but there is very little transparency um, and there's very little access um, to who's on these task teams. And it took a lot of behind the scenes crowdsourcing and uh, for the Africa continent, uh, we, we really did struggle getting all the countries on the continent. So it is one of the continents where we had less data than some other places. So, you know, again, where um, there is call for data happening, um, we would like to echo that, that that's incredibly important to be transparent and to have data that is sex and gender disaggregated. Um, but the Africa continent um, did not perform um, at higher levels as it, it does with the Ministry of Health representation. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, Dr. Mi uh, Miss Miriam, can you kindly uh, introduce your organization and uh, tell us what SRHR is to you? Uh, please let's do this within uh, four minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have four minutes to speak about my organization and speak about my views around the continent. Um, I'll speak about the Center for Reproductive Rights. The Center for Reproductive Rights is an international non-governmental organization, um, which, is, which has offices in different regions uh, in Africa, in Asia, in uh, Europe, in, um, in the US, that is in Washington, DC, in New York, and in Latin America. Our goal is to use the law to advance uh, sexual reproductive rights. And we do this through different strategies. Uh, through litigation, we hold states accountable through litigation. We build a movement of uh, reproductive rights advocates through our capacity building programs. And we also host a network called Africa uh, Reproductive Rights Initiative, 
which comprises um, organizations that advance reproductive rights of women and girls from 39 countries in Africa. And in addition to this, we do a lot of advocacy uh, at the Africa Union uh, with the human rights mechanisms, so that is the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, the African Committee of uh, on Child uh, on the rights of the child and welfare of the child, uh, and at the UN with the political and uh, the human rights mechanisms. Beyond this, we build evidence uh, for our, through our research programs to be able to challenge governments of the failure to implement existing progressive laws and policies. Um, in terms of where we are as a continent, um, I, would, I would actually give ourselves three. One, because of the, the regional commitments that we have at the AU level. And secondly, because of um, the framework that we have in terms of um, the blueprint pl uh, plans that we have. We do have different campaigns that have been launched um, uh, at the AU level, we have the campaign on a reduction of maternal mortality, neonatal mortality, and uh, child mortality as well. We do have a campaign on decriminalization of abortion in Africa that is actually hosted by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And we do have conversation, uh, ongoing conversation around universal health coverage. But then I look at the seven, that is the 70%, because of the restrictive laws that exist, and especially in the area of, in the area of abortion. To date, we only have three countries actually where a woman can seek abortion without restriction. Uh, and we have so many countries and which have just few exceptions, whether it's a lie, it's about the life of them, of the woman, or whether it's about medical emergency. And we have countries, a lot of them, uh, including Egypt, uh, that don't allow abortion at all. Um, so those restrictive laws essentially means that women cannot have access to um, life-saving services. And the second issue is essentially criminalization of adolescents. And I'm happy Leva is in this call, and I'm sure he's going to speak more about adolescents as well. So criminalizing adolescents essentially means that they are going to seek services and criminalizing them means that the numbers that we already have, that 26% of the maternal deaths in Africa, that is a total of 66% of maternal deaths that we contribute to the global maternal mortality in the world, that 26 of them actually, uh, percent of this is actually uh, adolescents who are dying because of unsafe abortion or who are dying because uh, during child uh, when they're giving birth. So when we criminalize adolescents, it essentially means that we're actually pushing them uh, to die. And then uh, I would speak about financing finally as another obstacle. And the reason why I'm actually giving the continent 7% because we see women being detained in the health facilities for inability to pay medical fees. Uh, we've seen women actually die while they're seeking services uh, because they're unable to afford them. And of course, privatization of healthcare means that women and girls have to pay so much for their section reproductive rights. Um, the last thing about what are the key issues, what are the two main obstacles? One is financing, I've already spoken about this. And uh, finally, it's about the, the fundamentalist approach to issues of section reproductive rights. We've seen so much growth of opposition in the last few years. We saw this during the ICPD. We see it at the national level. And we are worried that this actually has penetrated even to the legislative bodies. Opposition groups actually holding um, or what we call state capture of by opposition groups. They have infiltrated to the highest level, to the executive, to the, to the appointees of the government, the policy makers. They hold everything hostage that is related to sexual and reproductive rights of women. That means that implementation becomes very difficult. And it means that even in terms of change of law and repealing laws that restrict access to full range of sexual and reproductive health services and information becomes very difficult because of the way opposition has been operating and uh, essentially capturing the state and making sure that the state that does not comply with its obligation as provided for within regional and international human rights law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, let's move to Dr. Jacob Cholwi. Dr. Jacob, uh, can you please, in a brief time, tell us what SRHR is to you and what your organization does to promote SRHR in Africa? Sure. Thank you so much. And please uh, introduce myself quickly. I'm Dr. Tori I'm an academician. Uh, I teach at the University 
Guidance for Public Health are mostly Okay, seems uh, Dr. Jacob is having uh, a bit of a network uh, problem. Uh, would move to the outstanding Mr. Levi Singh. Mr. Levi, can you please talk to us about what SRHR is to you? And uh, Dr. We have a, we're already now expecting to hear more on adolescents from you, but please in a brief time, can you tell us what SRHR means to you and what your organization does to promote SRHR in Africa? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think that my colleagues on the panel have succinctly deduced uh, the, the core essential elements of SRHR. So I won't delve much into that. I will talk a bit about what we do at the SRHR Africa Trust and um, talk a bit about Africa's performance uh, in terms of my experience working within the, the policy space for adolescent and youth SRHR. Um, so at the onset, the SRHR Africa Trust works across the Eastern Southern African region on three key areas. We look at disrupting uh, service delivery and taking services out of the health facilities and to where young people actually are through the innovative uses of uh, technology. So we have um, various uh, Facebook mobile sites across Southern Africa, and it's a partnership with Facebook itself to use uh, low tech and free tech um, to get young people uh, to access healthcare services, especially SRHR services through innovative partnerships with IPPF member associations uh, across the Southern African region. Uh, the second area that we work in is on what, what uh, is much on what Miriam had touched on in terms of looking at harmful laws and policies and how harmful laws and policies uh, disincentivize adolescents and young people from accessing uh, the fullest extent of their SRHR. And that then bleeds into our third area of work, which is around meaningful youth engagement, participation, and leadership. Um, at SAT, we firmly believe that if young people aren't at the decision-making table and aren't inputting into the policies and the legislation and the public uh, programs that will go on to affect their health and shape their futures, um, we, we aren't really gearing ourselves up for a demographic dividend, but we're rather setting ourselves up for a demographic disaster. And this you'll know through our own demography on the continent with 60% um, of the, the continent's uh, population being um, between the ages of around uh, 10 to 35 years old. So those are our three main areas of work and, and our three focus areas. Um, with regards to our, our opinion on how Africa is performing on, on SRHR, I'd give Africa a, I'd give our region a five. Um, so I'm, I'm an internal optimist and uh, I've, I've looked at, at uh, at least the policy side. We've got good policy on paper, but we've got terrible policy in practice. So there's great stuff coming out of the African Union in terms of the Maputo Plan of Action 2016 to 2030. There's the Addis Declaration on Population Development, which actually goes further than ICPD in many ways in terms of talking about uh, key populations, in terms of talking about adolescent SRHR in particular. But there's, there's a lot more political will and uh, I think social re-engineering that needs to occur from us as young people in order to move these agendas forward and to get to that, um, that, that 10 out of 10 that we so desire. Uh, and then lastly, I think, um, again, on, on the issue of adolescent and youth SRHR, I think that is the bane of, um, of, our, of our fight for SRHR for all people on the continent at the moment. I think uh, Miriam had alluded to how criminalization of adolescence is contributing profoundly towards the, the poor state of, of health and well-being outcomes that an entire generation of adolescents and young people are confronted by on the continent. And for, for me, this actually is distilled further into uh, legacies of colonialism and apartheid and the fact that we've, we, we've stuck to these, um, to these Victorian age laws and these penal codes, which we still keep and which we still hold near and dear to. And it's really about looking at how to emancipate ourselves from, from this sort of thinking, and especially in our advocacy, looking at what pro-future policies and pro-future legislation looks like that acts in the best interests of adolescents and young people of the continent. So I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to a vibrant discussion and to getting into more of the nitty gritties. I like that. Uh, Rupa had mentioned the, um, the issue of uh, 
foreign influence on, on African politics, especially not just from um, the US government and, and other associated governments, but also from foreign groups and how foreign funded groups, uh, especially the Christian right, have been uh, really determining uh, African developmental policy and have been uh, seeking the ear of African decision makers and have been passing some really stark pieces of legislation and policy that have had profound impacts on, on people who are already the most left behind, including adolescents and young people and our LGBTI brothers and sisters. But I'll talk a bit more on the panel about that later. So thank you so much and uh, let's continue to engage. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Levi Singh. Uh, you really highlighted very important points and how we align foreign uh, organizations influence our decisions in Africa politically and health-wise, and also how we align religious influence inhibit um, proper development of health policies in Africa, having good policies on paper and very, very poor policies in practice. Dr. Jacob, are you back with us, please? <laughs> Okay, Cynthia, apologies for that. Um, yes, yeah. um, Dr. Cholo is an academician from the School of Public Health at the University of Zambia. Um, this just about uh, finding evidence that, uh, but in context, I'm an advocate for gender equality in global health leadership of the country. League for the Women in Global Health has been indicated by Ruka. So Women in Global Health Zambia is an initiative of this group of women and men who have been in practice academic management to the community. So we have women with diverse backgrounds and interests in global health. So what, what's our core? Our objective Um, hello, Dr. Jacob, are you there? Wow, wow, wow. Okay, since we're having network problems again. So, uh, we're going to move straight to the panel session. We have very, very, very interesting discussion mapped out for this panel session. Don't forget, as we move further, you have questions, please put them on the question box. And if you want to personally reach out to any of the speakers afterwards, uh, you can kindly request their email or contact address afterwards. Now, without um, wasting much time, uh, we I'll just go straight to the panel and session. Uh, and I pray Dr. Jacob comes back soon. Now, uh, the first question is, uh, will improving gender equity in Africa to um, substantially improve sexual reproductive health and rights in this region. I ask because uh, we usually combine the discussion of gender equity with the discussion of sexual reproductive health and rights, since most of the oppressed classes of um, individuals are the female sex. Now we're improving gender equity, improving sexual, improved SRR in the African region. And what steps has the um, the, your organization, Women for Global Health, taking to help improve gender equity and such reproductive health. So this goes to Dr. Rupa. Great, thank, thank you, Daniel. I covered a bit of this in my uh, opening remarks, but particularly at Women in Global Health, what we are trying to do is uh, really make a very clear connection between the fact that gender equality includes um, three core aspects for us. One is making sure that there is equal representation of men and women in decision-making. And we obviously acknowledge that gender is a spectrum, but particularly for us seeing that men and women are um, both at the leadership table and getting to decide um, over uh, their, their own health and shaping um, the decisions that are being made about their health. So that's one aspect. The second aspect of it is um, very much around uh, those that are working in the health sector, making sure that they actually have uh, truly uh, decent and safe working conditions and that they are compensated. So, so much of what happens in the health sector is unpaid. And so it's very much around making sure that we don't
don't uh, perpetuate inequity in the health sector because we know that majority of the health sector um, is those jobs are filled by women, but they are not represented in decision making. And the third aspect is really making sure that we link um, gender equality to being um, gender responsive health systems. And uh, for us to have gender responsive health systems, it is both looking at how men and women engage with the health system, making sure that um, access um, issues are uh, being uh, looked from a gender lens, that we uh, look at men's health and harmful masculinities as much as looking at uh, women and women's health and women's entire um, uh, life course approach to health and so not just focusing on women's uh, reproductive years, but their entire life course. And then uh, clearly part of that is about um, having uh, sexually productive health and rights, especially for young women. Um, we know that bodily autonomy and being able to decide over one's body is critical um, for girls' education and girls to then go on to to be young women that can fully participate in society um, with having jobs and um, going on to make leadership um, or take on leadership roles. And we can't separate um, the woman's ability or a girl's ability to choose over their own um, body. And what I mean by that is uh, making their own decisions about um, sexual health, deciding, uh, really support the, the champions of uh, She Decides and, and that movement, which they really clearly say that every, every Every girl should and every woman should be able to decide over her own body. And that's really critical to gender equality. So what we try to do in Women in Global Health is really link the gender equality agenda across all of these issues and be explicit that sexual reproductive health and rights is essential to achieve women's leadership. Too often um, we separate those issues and we say, well, you know, women's leadership can um, be in uh, separate to the access to sexually productive health and uh, contraceptives and the co comprehensive um, uh, access to all of the sexually reproductive health services. Too often we separate it. And um, what we're trying to do in Women in Global Health is link the two and be very clear that um, for women to reach their maximum potential and leadership, they need um, sexually productive health and um, uh, and their rights to be protected. And so that's that's been our approach. Um, we partner a lot with organizations that are very much um, strong SRHR advocates as their main area of work. And we have an alliance called Alliance on Gender and Universal Health Coverage. And that is where we bring 150 organizations together to advocate jointly. And, and some of the colleagues on today's call um, have been part of some of those engagement, engagement Engagements. And so that's another way that we work on these issues is through partnerships. So that, that would be another um, area that I would encourage um, all of us to really think about is how can we link our agendas and not see them as competing interests and uh, really see gender as cross-cutting and bring um, the sexually productive health and rights agenda with the gender equality agenda. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Rufa. That was awesome. Uh, women in global health are doing very, very wonderful. And uh, I, would, I, like most of my colleagues, would appreciate more if uh, there's also involvement in, of students who are interested in SRHR, like uh, Sheba, Ethiopia, Respect, Kenya, Renati, Nigeria, and other health student associations of productive health getting involved in the activities of women in global health. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Daniel, I'd say we'd, we'd love to have all of you join the movement, be part of chapters, forum chapters, and what our chapters do is really bring um, networks to uh, of networks together. And so we feel like the more hats you can wear in the gender equality area and bring people in that might not be necessarily um, working on these issues as their core area of work, but introduce and sensitize them, that's where the agenda will accelerate. So for us, all of the uh, sexually productive health and rights advocates, activists, we want you in our movement. We want to learn from you. We want to co-create with you. And we hope that our you know uh, messaging of bringing leadership and uh, a more comprehensive approach Approach to gender equality um, is uh, also the way that we continue to advance um, the collective agenda together. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is a follow up on this. We have a lot of things to advocate about as health students. We don't have to wait to our health practitioners. In different African regions, we have to advocate against gender based violence, we have to advocate against violence against um, the adolescent and girl child. We have to advocate against rape. We have to advocate against abuses on the reproductive and health rights of women and men. 
And you see, most health students want to go for these advocacies, but we have problems because we're in Africa, uh, we're in a region that is very, very religious or centric. We're in a region that shies away from this talk from SRHR. Dr. Dagi, working with Sheba, how would you advise um, health students to improve their advocacy on sexual reproductive health and rights in their region as their form of public health advocacy? Um, okay, so <clears throat> it's actually uh, true. Sometimes it's even very difficult um, to even start the conversation. Um, so living in Africa where uh, we have to be dealing with cultures where we have society that um, stands in the front telling you things should um, go the way they have been for decades. I think it's very wise to use, um, to use the youth and be an advocate, to use the youth as being an advocate of change. So something that I would like to, um, um, something that I would like to um, emphasize, but that you already know, is that advocacy-wise, I strongly believe that when we educate people and when we give them the right tools so they will live a healthier life, I think that we can empower these epic capacities and um, avoid the life-threatening episodes that we saw too many times in our hospitals, in our um, village, um, and and um, and yeah, so many. Um, so we do have this. Um, so much benefit from um, investment in resources in the prevention approach, as can be the high cost of treatment and dealing with the um, consequences. Um, I also believe that engaging the um, sexual and reproductive health and rights issues in the public agenda, I think that would enable individuals to know more about their own um, risk and that could be one big um, accomplishment. So I think it's also very important to engage, the, um, engage in the public education, public advocacy and public awareness um, we should take leadership also whenever opportunities arise because that is also a so leader is also one important thing. So um, I urge you and I urge everyone to actively engage in this process because um, you can contribute a lot in several ways and we need to recognize uh, the potential of prevention and joint hands that are actors in the medical field or in paramedical field with similar interests and we should have the pressure and inform decision makers and politicians on the SRHR issues uh, because having uh, so um, you know, governmental involvement is also very important um, in the prevention and it would improve the active and the uh, long-term service. Thank you so much, Dr. Daji. That was a very, very comprehensive answer. Uh, students that are interested in promoting sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa, you are free to uh, reach out to Dr. Daji for advices or reach out to respect a reproductive education program for Kenyan teenagers, or you can reach out to Renate Nigeria, reproductive education for Nigeria adolescents and teenagers on how to go about these advocacy in your country and tackle common obstacles. The COVID-19 came with different challenges, and uh, I would like to speak a bit on the challenges that it posed in sexual reproductive health and rights. In Africa, we saw that there were a lot of running into thousands teenage girls that got pregnant during the COVID-19 period over the first two months. Uh, and also, we noticed that in um, Ghana, for example, within the first two weeks, we got a report that about 9,000 women tested positive for an unwanted pregnancy in Nigeria, although the statistics is obviously adulterated. We also learned that about 3,600 um, sexual assault cases happened. COVID-19 had a lot of impact on sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa. So please, uh, Le Mr. Levy, can you tell us what challenges COVID-19 had in the activities of sexual reproductive and SRHR Africa and Trust in uh, promoting uh, advocacy and comprehensive sexual education in Africa and how you tackle this? Oh, Mr. Levy. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, so, yeah, it, COVID definitely did have a huge impact on our programming, and uh, we've had to do a lot of reprogramming to to um, face the challenges of the new normal, but yet the new necessary at the same time. Um, so, the, the three things that I really did want to touch on with regards to CSE in in, in specific was looking at at how pre-COVID-19, there was already the fact that around 60% of African adolescents and young people 
we're already not necessarily on a trajectory to completing uh, post-secondary education, what we would refer to as a basic education system. So uh, a substantial amount of young people are already out of school. And uh, if there's anything that the epidemiologists and, and scientists tells us is that um, school and, and staying in school is probably the most uh, beneficial and, and um, expeditious investment that um, ministries of, of health and of education can take and make in terms of dealing unwanted pregnancies, in terms of um, ensuring that you delay new HIV infections and, and a plethora of other great health benefits for adolescents and young people. So we were doing terribly prior to COVID and COVID has just gone on and, and exemplified that. At, at the height of, of the lockdowns across the African continent, I think we saw around 127 million adolescents and young people out of school. My own country in South Africa, four months into schools reopening, we still have 56,000 young people who have not returned to school. And I think across the region from Zambia to South Africa to Kenya to Uganda, we're also seeing um, quite the, the rise in uh, ad adolescent pregnancies. And uh, it's been really difficult for civil society organizations to work with ministries of health, especially under hard lockdowns uh, to ensure that um, basic access uh, to, to uh, essential SRHR services were maintained. But in many cases, we managed to do that successfully. But on the issue of CSC in particular, uh, there were knee-jerk reactions from some ministries of education whereby uh, they ran towards trying to take things online. And um, I, I think we must understand the context of, of these virtual platforms and virtual engagement. Prior to COVID-19, around 60% or 66% of the African continent was actually offline. Uh, the, the, the overall digital penetration for the African continent at the end of 2019 was only 34%. So th this idea that everything can be done online is, is quite the fallacy for, for Africa and uh, our, our means and ways um, in, in terms of ensuring that young people could access uh, comprehensive sexuality education and information was through utilizing uh, traditional media sources such as community media in particular community radio stations in, in, in Southern Africa. So looking at uh, the power of community media, which is relatively cheap, it's relatively accessible, and, uh, and, and having partnerships with these community radio stations to ensure that uh, you could at least get a 15 to 20, to some cases an hour lesson done from uh, a young person who either works with a youth-led or youth-serving organization to uh, talk about issues pertaining to, uh, to SRHR, but also deliver timeless and, and um, accurate information that is useful to adolescents and young people in, in their uh, community settings from reliable sources. Um, I, I think one of the most concerning things over this, this eight months has been, and I, I see someone had shared it within the comment box, there has been a, a grave regression across the African continent with regards to SRHR, uh, in particular CSC. In the last three months, at least in Eastern Southern Africa, we've seen an onslaught on, on, on Zambia, on Namibia, uh, on, on Ethiopia, on Kenya, uh, with regards to uh, their support of comprehensive sexuality education. And uh, we, as a collective of civil society organizations, we've been following the money and we've been following uh, the, some of the groups behind uh, these imperatives. And we were astounded to know that in the last two years, um, Christian fundamental groups from uh, Washington and a few other uh, places in, in the United States have been funder, funding quite vehemently uh, and, and, and promoting uh, anti-SRHR and, and anti-CSE um, um, anti messaging and, and uh, have been, as Miriam had alluded to, schmoozing with uh, members of parliament and other key legislators and key decision makers in, in national parliaments and in national government administrations to, in, to, to hinder uh, the, the rollout of comprehensive sexuality education um, within, within the midst of this pandemic and even as schools started to reopen. Um, the most recent case that we've, uh, we've gotten involved in was in Zambia where just uh, two weeks ago, um, a, a foreign funded organization had managed to successfully get a uh, private members bill 
uh, into Parliament to ask for the complete uh, scrapping of the CSE curricula in Zambia. And thankfully, through advocacy and through good work from civil society organizations in the Zambian space, um, that, that motion didn't carry through. But there's still an onslaught because we understand that there's an election year in, in Zambia next year. But in, in other places, such as Namibia and, and in Kenya, we hear, and, and Ethiopia, the fight is just continuing and it's picking up. I'm not necessarily too uh, optimistic about a, a, a Biden administration because it seems as if the far right are out here and they definitely are uh, well organized and well resourced and they have an agenda. And I think for us as progressives who uh, believe in SRHR for all people without distinction of any kind, we need to use this moment to build further solidarity, but also build and trade intelligence in terms of how to mitigate this um, risk that is going to continue to, uh, to express itself uh, further uh, as we, we, we try to build back better from this pandemic. So in a nutshell, um, the, the, the innovations that we use to, uh, to maintain comprehensive sexuality education within this, this uh, time of lockdowns and with young people being out of school was uh, through using community media, in, in particular community radio stations to ensure that young people can access comprehensive information and education from reliable sources. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Mr. Levi. That was very, very, very informative. Uh, going further, uh, it's very, very hard to talk about sex in Africa without speaking about the sins and the prizes of sex in Africa. I'm referring to sexually transmitted infections. Uh, the famous president among them is HIV and AIDS. As a matter of fact, 1st of December is celebrated as World AIDS Day. It was generally created to reduce stigmatization in Africa, to reduce stigmatization of um, HIV and AIDS patients and try to make the world see them more as brethren and less as um, repelling tests. But still, the WHO statistics for this year showed that uh, there was an increase in those who acquired uh, who got infected with HIV and AIDS. And on the female side, girls who were between the ages of 15 to 19 were most infected and those who were in Africa and those who were within the ages of 35 to 50 among the men were most infected. I and some colleagues on a uh, menstrual health group in Kenya did argue that did this mean that men who were 35 years and above were having uh, a lot of unprotected sex with yeah. young girls who are within the age of 15 to 19. But the problem remains that HIV increased in Africa. So my question goes to Dr. Jacobs. How can we work to save our women and girls from the menace of the HIV infection and other sexually transmitted infection within the scope of sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa? Dr. Jacobs, please. Thank you, Daniel, uh, and, and apologies for, for the drop in internet. But just to respond to this uh, very important question of how do we work on saving our women and girls from this burden. Indeed, this burden has been longstanding and yet it still affects our women and girls. And so as women in global health Zambia, not just Zambia, but global, we think that we must look at some fundamentals or key drivers in terms of the cause of this infection. This is, has been a longstanding infection. It's not as new as COVID. And so we think that going forward, we really need to invest in looking at the key drivers to this infection and not just HIV and all other STIs, sexually transmitted diseases, among groups that are being affected. And based on our demographic health surveys across Africa, it looks like some groups are more disadvantaged. They are more affected. And most of our statistics reveal that these groups include the poor, disabled, but more recently, including in Zambia, interestingly, we are seeing that the urban poor populations are affected most. So to respond to this question, we think that in order to address this problem, we ought to look at the drivers critically of these problems because these drivers are quite diverse, but I could quickly categorize them in two, into two categories. We think that we need to pay attention to health systems related 
drivers that are mostly anchored on the six pillars of the health system. And these include issues of financing, issues of commodities for preventive measures, I mean, commodities for preventive measures, and also not only look at the health system related factors, but also focus on the demand side. There are factors that are inherent in most of these groups that are influencing the, the, the behaviors and also leading to the infections that we are, we are seeing. So in short, what I'm saying is that we ought to address these challenges that we are seeing uh, based on evidence. And this should be focusing on evidence-based interventions. We are aware of the efforts that are being done by most of the researchers in most countries, but we think that probably more efforts could be applied. Efforts that are contextually targeted and targeting the most affected groups. In this case, we are seeing with our statistics, young people are now being more affected. And, um, and we think that if we, we target our interventions and all our efforts that we are putting in on these groups that are being affected, most likely we're going to achieve the 90% accuracy that we are thinking about in terms of sexual and reproductive health. But also we, we need to understand that as we have seen with statistics from WHO, that most of these groups that are affected are women and girls. And so we need to understand that these women and girls are different. Different in different contexts, in different regions, but I want to focus on the difference based on what they do and what they are involved in. So most of them are out of school and others are in school. So we think that when we talk about targeted interventions, we need to think of girls who are in school. What do we do about girls who are in school? We are aware of the efforts that are being made to increase uh, the power in girls for making decisions. And, 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 and to be aware about their rights. So we think that we, we need to keep banging and checking on our curriculums that should include comprehensive education that creates awareness for these girls on their rights to be able to make decisions and to be able to prevent themselves from HIV infection. But we, we also argue that these interventions should not just be confined to the classroom. We also have girls and women that are in the community. And so we think that targeted interventions for women that for women and girls that are in the communities are equally key. And efforts are being done, but we are re-emphasizing as women in global health to say we ought to use and engage influencers in the communities. We are aware and evidence shows that we have groups of people within our communities that are so influential. Communities and individuals and groups that influence women and girls' decisions. And we think if we engage all these groups and not just work as a health system and as researchers, but engage our communities, such approaches we think that could help raise more voices and help in mitigating some of these challenges that we are seeing, particularly related to HIV infection. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, Dr. Jacob. Uh, that is true. We need to keep uh, doing more advocacy to help the women and girls in our community that they are most predisposed to HIV infection and other STDs. As regards HIV infection, we all know that one of the most vulnerable groups to HIV infection are those of the LGBTQ community, especially amongst same-sex men. As to this, and the fact that most African countries um, criminalize the LGBTQ, deprive them of some healthcare services and reproductive services, is there really hope? Is there really light at the end of the tunnel in um, health? for the LGBTQ community. Dr. Miriam, please, can you speak to us on this?
Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I really aspire to this doctor title. Um, I'm happy that you keep associating me with this title. So I'm really aspiring to be a doctor very soon. Um, I'll begin by saying, yes, there's hope. And the reason why there's hope is because um, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And what this means is that there is no way you're going to selectively uh, say that we're going to grant a certain group of people rights and deny others rights based on their sexual orientation. I want us to reflect back about the women rights movement, the disability rights movement, and see the challenges that women rights movement fa um, faced uh, sometimes back and where we are at the moment. And because um, we have traditionally selected who we want to advocate for and who we want to put somewhere close that we don't want to be associated with these particular rights. But gradually we engage. And the reason why I say there's light is because as long as the law is very clear, as long as the, the international law, the regional law is very clear, and the law that binds us all, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, um, states that everybody is born free it doesn't say that so and so, it says everybody is born free of dignity and rights. And for us, the question is, how do we get there? Uh, and what lessons can we learn from the women and disability rights movement? Um, and the question is around holding states accountable. Accountable. I don't know how many of you are aware of um, the, the campaign and the 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 case that was litigated before the High Court of Kenya around repealing um, uh, section 162 and section 165 of the penal code, which criminalize uh, same sex. Um, and even though the court did not um, rule as we hope that we could rule, it's very important. It's a very important step uh, challenging the status quo, the status quo of discriminating people on the basis of their sexual orientation. And this is the, the path or the roadmap that have been used in some by many movements to challenge, for instance, within the women, uh, women movements, the disinheritance, where women were seen as objects, where persons with disabilities were also seen, seen as objects. So holding states accountable through litigation is one of the key strategies of ensuring that there's hope, continue challenging laws that continue uh, criminalizing the LGBTQ community. Secondly, we have to create a lot of awareness. Um, I'm sure we have been speaking, uh, Rope has been speaking, Leva has been speaking about the issue and the rise of fundamentalism, the rise of opposition. And the key things that opposition uh, speak about when it comes to SRHR is that they will run to the parliaments, they will, run, they will run to the executive and say that people who speak about abortion, they're essentially speaking about uh, 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 legalizing same-sex marriages, and they will speak about adolescence. So they tie these issues together, and there's no way you can actually do advocacy on one particular issue. When you speak about SRHR, you have to speak about issues of LGBTQ. And from an intersectional perspective, you have to see them as groups that has to be looked at because they are going to be um, to be discriminated uh, on basis of their sexual orientation. So there's need for a lot of campaign and uh, awareness raising and there's need for a cross movement engagement that means that, that means that the LGBT community has to work with the other movements and the women rights movement cannot say that we are actually pushing for women rights uh, uh, issues when actually they are isolating LGBT community. Um, and the same with the disability rights movement. So there's a need for cross movement engagement on this particular issue. And the other issue it's essentially around uh, holding even individuals accountable. You as a person uh, knowing and building your capacities and more even in terms of research, building evidence around people, uh, the LGBT community, the challenges they face, and looking at it from different uh, aspects, the health issue as well, when you speak about HIV, and looking at what are the entry points that we need for us to be able to engage different stakeholders. I think that's really, really important. And for me, in a nutshell, I, I say that, yes, there is light uh, and there's hope around this campaign around the LGBT community being able to access services on an equal basis as others. Thank you. That, that was, that was, uh, I think that speech needs to be given at the UN. It was so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Miriam. And please forgive me. I keep putting the doctor in front. I feel the spirit is speaking. You know, 
a few months back, Nigeria just went through a very, very wonderful time in the revolution of the country. In fact, I don't think there's been such revolution uh, except when we were moving for our independence. However, there was a scenario that happened when uh, some famous lesbians in Nigeria uh, also joined the NSAS protest and they wore the normal LGBTQ rainbow um, flags as they carried the NSAS banner. And other Nigerians who were campaigning against rape, who were campaigning against women oppression, who were campaigning against police brutality, saw the flags and the banners that these LGBTQ members were carrying and disbanded them and stopped them from joining the protest. In fact, um, one of them had to release a press statement later explaining that she did nothing wrong. Uh, so Dr. Bosiri, can you kindly tell me if we're advocating against other um, negatives in the SRHR uh, advocacy, if we're advocating against rape, we're advocating against uh, gender oppression, uh, is LGBTQ rights also SRHR rights? Dr. Bosiri, please, you may have the floor. Thank you so much, Otobo, for this um, uh, once more um, opportunity to be able to speak. I mean, every time, every time I hear about the differentiation around sexual reproductive health and rights of queer folks, transgender non-conforming people, and of the mainstream, which is heteronormative, from a heteronormative um, angle, I usually ask myself, why is it that we differentiate that? I believe that the right to make decisions that govern one's body should be free of stigma and discrimination and coercion. That these decisions are related to sexuality, reproduction, and the use of sexual and reproductive health services. That SRHR information and services should be accessible and affordable to all individuals who need them, regardless of their age, marital status, social economic status, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And if you look at a lot of our constitutional provisions, I mean, most of us who are sitting in this group today <coughs> have been colonized by the British. So a lot of our, a lot of our borrowing is from the common law system. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm currently a medical doctor who's also a student of law. And one of the things I'm realizing that there's a lot of things that bring us together than separators, that we have been able to actually differentiate the rights of the sexual minorities from the right of the heteronormative um, 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 uh, sexual and uh, sexual rights, it's actually heartbreaking. I believe that we are supposed to be inclusive, collaborative, innovative, and responsive. That even when we challenge the conceived um, negative um, perceptions, either be real or perceptive around LGBTIQ rights, and also work with them in isolation from mainstream sexual and reproductive health and rights, we actually overlook the existence of multiple identities and circumstances that shape and determine how people experience their lives. Personally, I believe that movement building, and you know what movement building has done in this world? From the time of Karl Marx, to the time of Martin Luther King, to the time of Audre Lorde, what we've witnessed is that when you build movement and organizational support that underpins an intersectional approach to reproductive rights, which addresses discrimination and violation perpetrated by both the state and the state, uh, the state's uh, non-state actors, we acknowledge that the experiences of queer people, transgender non-conforming people are unique and different. That from this intersectional lens, we are able to question where are the sources of violence, particularly from the LGBTQ, uh, LGBTIQ people? How is it that we can be able to address the way in which patriarchy, class oppression, and other systems of discrimination create inequalities that structure the relative situations of marginalized people? We also have to take into account, not just the now, but where is the history? I have been privileged to have been a fellow from the British Council. And I went to the House of Lords in the UK, in the House of Commons. And one of the questions I posed to them is, we exist, we still are implementing laws and policies which were inherited from you, our colonizers, yet you, our colonizers, have been very progressive. You've changed your policies around same-sex relationship. You've changed your policies around um, 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 same-sex marriages. You've, you've actually not only decriminalized, but also criminalized any human rights violations against the LGBTIQ. We need to be able to look at where is our history? What does that history around social political context? And recognizing 
that that has a very big inter um, a very big part to interplay. We also need to be able to question the place of patriarchal status within the African continent that continue to seclude women in attaining of their dignity, their rights, straining also from the just the traditional definition of who a woman is. And from this part, it looks for a woman from a binary lens, like it's either heterosexual. So anything that actually deconstructs, destabilizes the heteronormativity is perceived to be wrong. And yet, what does that do? It literally shuts down bisexual, lesbian, trans and gender non-conforming identities. Inadvantably, what this, what this has ended up doing is slamming opportunities for LBQ, trans, gender non-conforming women from realizing their highest standards of reproductive health. I mean, look at our healthcare system. It's actually completely binary, ableistic. I mean, did we think about our healthcare system to be able to take about of our people living with disability? Hell to the no, and I'm sorry to be able to say that. I'm actually, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking when we don't look at our healthcare system from an intersectional perspective, because what it does is, we and the fund in terms of somebody spoke about somebody spoke about financial resources financial investment so what we've ended up doing is underfunded ostracized lbq trans intersex and female gender non-conforming women who continue to exist within environment of the healthcare system demanding and wanting to access healthcare from a non-binary lens so what does that do access to accurate information. And I know part of the conversations that you're having today is around um, comprehensive sexuality education. What does that mean? So it has actually marginalized this population to have access to accurate information about their sexuality, about their reproductive health, about their sexual need, and what has, that, what has this done? And, 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 and I had somebody talk about the disproportional effect around HIV and AIDS, around the queer population, LGBTIQ, and, 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 and thinking about why is it that this very population has actually been disfranchised to a point that transgender women within the African continent, is actually globally, bear the highest level in terms of prevalence of HIV and AIDS. Why is it that gay men and men who have sex with men and less and 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 and, and bisexual women and men have the highest proportion of HIV and AIDS? Because we have not availed accurate um, access to accurate information. We've not availed safe, effective, affordable, and acceptable contraceptive methods. Every time I get into a space and everyone is speaking about contraception, I usually ask, but you've left out the bisexual men bisexual woman, the trans woman, the trans rather, the trans man, you've let them out. Why is it? And contraceptives, a lot of people just think about hormonal. And yet the whole LGBTIQ spectrum talks about female condoms. Actually, now we are even refreshing it. Dr. Kla Leng, a very good friend of mine and who's currently the, the, the UN rapporteur on human on, on health and rights, speaks about it's an internal condom. It's not a male, it's not a female condom. Why does she say this? Because the prejudice that has been placed around the female condom has been big, very underfunded, very less spoken about, and yet every single public entity you enter, you will find male condoms. So where is the place of this? Where is the place of people living with HIV and AIDS and who are queer over the decade, particularly around LBQ women? We have not documented the HIV prevalence around them. I believe that to be able to improve and empower queer folks, we, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to enjoy their higher standard of reproductive health is to equip them as well as their communities to transform mainstream societal organization and the environment. Again, it's every single day they are struggle around homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, and enabling, ensuring that we have an enabling environment that support them as well as integration uh, LGBTIQ into our reproductive health. The whole panel sit there, but one person, I have not heard about an integration of LGBTIQ. And even as you're speaking about, and even the, the, the just um, segregation around people who speak around LGBTIQ, because we have been working in this field, we continue to work in this field, and we continue to advocate, not just from I being a medical doctor and also a legal expert, but also from a lived experience, to be able to nuance this, to be able to integrate this into our reproductive health is something that we continue to live out. However, there is hope. I usually like nuancing the negative, but also thinking about 
what is the hope within the African continent? We have to recognize power of the movement building. I will tell you this for a fact, and you can quote me anywhere else, that the constitutional reforms within the African continent have been led by queer folks in this continent. In Kenya, in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Nigeria, they have been pushed against the place of, of, of Bill of Rights, the place of equality, the place of stigma and discrimination has been pushed and continues to be pushed by queer folks in this country. And that tells you one thing. It's a movement that represents 15 to 20% of every population in every country, WHO statistic, but it's a very powerful movement. It's a powerful movement that has nuanced what freedom of association looks like, has nuanced what stigma and discrimination around social needs, healthcare, housing, access to education, what that looks like. And, and out of that, we actually have precedent, laws that have em 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 emanated from this very powerful movement that has been able to do that. I want to believe that for us to be able to build a resilient and an open society, it takes ownership. Ownership for women in global health. I'm actually a member of Women in Global Health. To be able not just to speak about the mainstream women, but also to nuance the bias around, or the, not the bias, the blind spot around LBQ women, trans, gender non-conforming women in the conversation around it. I also have to also bring to your attention that we need to have radical action that has to ensure that reproductive also sexual and gender minorities is achieved by pushing for better funding movements to reverse the opposition efforts. I work for uh, Uwai Yashri that funds seven Eastern African countries and also the Pan-African movement. So I find the African queer, I find the, 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 the Ilga, Ilga Africa, I find most of those um, and, and the trans organizing within the African continent. But I will tell you, GPP, which is the Global Philanthropic Project, released statistics around funding within the African queer population. And it's heartbreaking that we get a dollar for every $100 that is used on other, <clears throat> on other mainstream. Um, um, actually less than a dollar, let me rephrase, less than a dollar for every hundred dollars that is expended on the other human rights um, 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 work. And yet we talk about human rights being indivisible, non-transferable. How is it so? Why is it that we want to cherry pick which human rights are sexy, which human rights are acceptable, which human rights are conformist? Because when we start segregating on conformation, on 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 um, acceptability politics, then we are a, we actually other. We are othering the queer and sexual minorities. So I sit here, be able to tell you this: that we have an opportunity to be able to offer capacity support. We are able to facilitate skills training for in terms of developing queer and gender folks. I mean, if you look at if you look at what it is that we are able to do within the African continent, we can build strategic partnership. I am. I'm, 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 I sit here in, the, in my position as the co ed of Ohio, very proud to have gotten a grant that actually looks at connecting the dots from a global funding organization. Can you connect the dots from East African region to West African region to North African region to Central African region around the queer movement, transgender non-conforming, to be able to actually speak in one voice? I mean, we are here conversing around. SRHR, and yet CAL, the Coalition of African Lesbian, was actually expurged, purged completely out from being an observer in the African Union. Why? That tells you that even as you speak about the GGR, a lot of people think about when you talk about the global gag rule, it's only talking about abortion and access to contraceptives. No. So some of you who have had the opportunity to be able to interact with what we call the global, um, it's actually called the. Um, let me get let me get the word. Uh, one minute, one minute, one minute. So let me give you. Somebody can help me. So recently, the U.S. government started um, building consensus around. Oh, it's called the Geneva Consensus Declaration. I do not know how many of you have been able to look at that document, how many of you have been able to interrogate the place of that document, because that document speaks about abortion, refreshes the place of abortion, nuances the place of abortion as not a right to women, but the right of family. By discussing a place of family, it talks about the binary lens. So disregarding the place of queer, gender non-conforming and transgender people to be able to have an opportunity to have families. It actually literally looks at P2, the emergency contraceptive pool as an abortiform. 
if you read that language very carefully. And to be able to nuance this, we must be able to ensure advancing inclusion of LGBTIQ in the global policies such as the Sustainable Development Goals in a way that development policies and program must catch up. What is the slogan of SDGs? Leave no one behind. And yet, the biggest burden of HIV, one of the global um, health issues, which has brought multilaterals, global health practitioners, global philanthropics together, is actually HIV. Yet the biggest population that bears the biggest burden of this disease has been left behind. What do we do? However, there's also an opportunity for us to provide a broader evidence that expands on the health needs of sexual and gender minorities beyond HIV. I keep telling people that the human is an intersectional past. The human is a 360 human being. I am not just HIV. I have mental health issues. I have, I have a livelihood. Where is my social and economic rights? Why is it that I speak about adequate and dignified housing? Why is it that I speak about access to education? So until we also change that lens around an intersectional perspective, it becomes very difficult for us to have this conversation because this conversation nuances only a one angle point. Finally, I would actually want to challenge each and everyone who is seated in this room and even the medical students. I know, I, I mean, in my introduction, I talked about how it is that we, um, the global um, activists, what they did is that they pushed WHO to be able to decriminalize the place where transgender or other sexual orientation and gender identity had been classified as a gender dysphoric, meaning from a mental health perspective, that's a disease, it's not a disease. Can we be able to continue ensuring that the mental health of queer folks, issues interfacing are be able to discuss, that we are able to actually sit down and nuance the policies. And I, and I like the person who spoke about decriminalization, policies, it, decriminalization is not enough. And, and my previous speaker just before I spoke, talk about, um, spoke about what, um, 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 penal code section 162, 165. In Uganda, we even have anti-homosexual bill, which is actually being introduced as a private, a private bill. Magufuli in Tanzania literally publicly criminalizes same-sex relationship. Where is it that we sit in that space? How is it that we can be able to? So as advocates Dr. of Bufiri. young people, we can be able to change so much. Dr. Bufiri. Uh, yes. Obviously, I, I, I can, uh, like, I can most, go on and on, and I'm sorry I have yeah, taken yeah, yeah. up more of my time. But <laughs> like, yes. like most yeah. of we as a HR advocate, let me, let me know that there. there is a lot left undone as regards LGBTQ rights and health in Africa. Uh, I feel we could even hold a separate webinar just LGBTQ rights and health in Africa. <laughs> I know, like uh, it will be a one week program, like with a whole curriculum. <laughs> Like it's not like wow. we are stopping. We are speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking. I but thank you. At least I've highlighted that. some of the most important um, or strategic opportunities that we have as medical students, as people who are already doing this work, but also nuancing where our 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 blind spots are and be able to speak about all these issues. Thank you so much, Ma. Uh, so uh, we have very stringent time left. Uh, please, in um, three minutes or two minutes, can you please kindly tell us what the major difference is between feminism and gender equity? Because I, I, um, I was doing, I, I was to give, be a speaker at the panelist and the um, topic was uh, patriarchy in feminism. I'm like, that is oil and water, but we still had to speak. Uh, so this question goes to Dr. Rupadat. Is there a difference between feminism and gender equity in the strive for SRHR and women's rights? Please, thanks. The thanks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Daniel. And um, I just want to say I, I just love the passion um, that uh, Stella had earlier and agree with everything. And I think we do have to bring these discussions of um, SRHR gender equality through a more intersectionality lens. And that includes acknowledge, acknowledging the LGBTQI aspect. So I think want to really just acknowledge that before I dive into your answer, Daniel. And I think you know, what you're saying there is the two are quite linked, um, feminism and gender equity, um, but they're not the same. Uh, feminism particularly does um, carry a lot of baggage. So, so sadly, not everyone wants to use 
that term. Um, feminism goes beyond gender equity into all forms of equity and inclusion, including race, disability, and caste. And that is one of the unique things about feminism is it is a very social justice, um, women's rights-based agenda that is very comprehensive. It has its um, place and it is very linked um, to the gender equality um, agenda. And particularly when, um, when we talk about sexual reproductive health and rights, we refer to all genders, not just women. And when we're discussing really what gender equity is about, um, we need to acknowledge that it is uh, uh, really about engaging all genders, uh, including men, and uh, really making sure that both of those um, and all genders uh, across the spectrum um, truly uh, the process is to create equality. So there is a difference between feminism and gender equity. Um, they're not, uh, you know, working uh, against each other, they're working together, but there is a distinction um, on that path on that aspect. And Daniel, I know we're uh, nearly at time, and I wanted to also just pick up on one of the other questions if you uh, um, allow me to, but it is very much around, um, you know, this question that has come up many times about abortion and, you know, how does abortion fit into um, sexually productive health and rights? And we at Women in Global Health, we support a woman's right to choose what she does with her body, when and who she has sex with, who she loves, who she marries, when she has a child, and banning safe abortions drives a lot of that underground and increases the death of women. Um, we also uh, want to say that you know women should be able to make these decisions. Right now, uh, most parliamentarians are men. Um, only 24 per, uh, uh, percent of the parliamentarians globally are women, and it's men who are making the decisions on behalf of women. And so, really, you know, we're not saying that um, every every country and every place. Um, should promote abortion at all. What we're saying is that every uh, place should ha have women's ability to choose over their own bodies. And that includes um, making sure that when we talk about um, the, the rights of uh, women and the rights of all people, all families, it should include the comprehensive uh, sexually reproductive health agenda, which does include including safe abortion as one of the many options. And um, there's a lot of questions about where does religion fit into this? We know that faith is important. Faith gives us resilience. It gives us hope. Um, and every individual should have a right to determining their own you know, ability to exercise and use faith. But the two are not at battle with each other and they don't have to be. And these are dynamic, um, um, dynamic aspects like social change uh, is evolving. Religion does evolve. And it is really the right, it is, it, it is a, in the hands of the people that are participating in, in all of the rights work to really look at how can we shape the discussions and bring those communities in with us to actually take on this agenda and support the comprehensive agenda of all people. So Daniel, I'll turn it, turn it back to you. I know you asked me just about feminism and equity um, and I really wanna, again, echo those two are linked, but they're uniquely different. And let's really think about how we bring the human rights agenda forward um, in, in these discussions. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, Dr. Rupa. I'm really grateful that you even went far uh, to also speak about abortions. Uh, as a matter of fact, unsafe abortions is among the major menaces uh, and one of the highest leading causes of death in maternal, maternal mortality in Africa. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, my next question goes to uh, Dr. Miriam. Uh, Dr. Miriam, as a matter of fact, uh, as of 2015, the uh, statistics was released that showed that about 50,000 teenage girls and women die every year because of um, unsafe abortion practices in Nigeria. I know the statistics all over Africa has a lot of statistics on unsafe abortion. Uh, we also, uh, the, this year, where they were cleaning the Nairobi River in um, Kenya, they found out that uh, about, they found about 16, if I'm not wrong, 16 teenage babies that were thrown into the Nairobi River that they were clearing. This shows that some women may not commit this abortion, but they still don't want to keep this pregnancy. So which means that it's important for women to be given the right to choose if they want to keep a pregnancy or not. We have a lot of people dying in Africa, in Nigeria, and we have babies being born, being abandoned, and those being thrown in rivers. So Dr. Miriam, your question, how can we deal with the issues surrounding abortion in Africa? 
Um, so, Miss Miriam. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, uh, Daniel. Um, and I just want to pick from what Rob has said. Um, the more we criminalize abortion, the more women are going to procure and safe abortion, the more we're going to record um, mat uh, mortality deaths uh, due to unsafe abortion within, within the region. And therefore, my first point, um, and just to make sure that I summarize this because of time, the first point is actually we have to decriminalize, to decriminalize abortion. And I've said this even in the beginning, we have to decriminalize abortion. We have to ensure that we have um, uh, laws that allow women to access uh, safe, and legal abortion. And this, what it means is that women will, will, have, will make a choice. Um, and also in times uh, of emergencies, women can have access to these services without being denied them. Because every time we criminalize abortion and where the laws really restrict abortion, um, we will find that even police officers, because if you look at the laws that criminalize abortion, including the penal code, that police officers uh, will use these uh, laws to harass and uh, extort uh, health providers. And because of this, you'll find that even where a woman requires <clears throat> or uh, qualifies for safe and legal abortion, they're not going to get the service because the health provider is stood between providing and so, uh, providing a life-saving service and being prosecuted, uh, wrongly prosecuted for, for providing this service. So it's very important to have clear laws that really uh, elaborate uh, when um, when a woman can be able to access um, safe and legal abortion. And just to mention that uh, recently the center was able to, uh, to do research in Kenya. If you, if you all know about the constitution of Kenya, it's one of the progressive constitution in the world. And article 26.4, it speaks about um, uh, grounds uh, under which women uh, can access safe and legal abortion. And when we were doing our research, we were able to analyze to what extent has this article been implemented within the country. And we saw the challenges that women and girls face, they are prosecuted wrongly, and also the health providers are harassed by um, by police officers, and also they're also prosecuted wrongly for providing life-saving services. The second issue is actually financing. And I think this is very important. And I'll, I'll also uh, add my voice to the Geneva consensus and also to speak to the, uh, uh, link this to the ICPD outcome document. And it, because it's very important as you speak about universal health coverage, that we speak and, um, and prioritize abortion as, a, as one of the sexual and reproductive health uh, service that has to be prioritized by governments. Therefore, the financing is not just about the issue of post-abortion care. We don't have to wait for women to be dying um, after procuring unsafe abortion for us to save them. We have to save them before. We have to think of preventive measures. And this includes ensuring that we finance uh, services, uh, abortion as a, as, a, as, a, as a priority uh, in terms of sexual and reproductive health. And the, the other issue is actually provision of uh, uh, information. When women are able to get comprehensive and accurate information, then they are able to decide and make a choice. Uh, and therefore they will also be able to make info, to uh, get access to contraception, for instance. So it's very important to have comprehensive information. So when you hide information or disinform the women and girls about issues of abortion, um, then you create a perception that it's actually legal, that it's, it's, it's something that you should not speak about it at all. And this is the reason why women will actually turn to quarks even when they are actually able to qualify within the grounds that has been set within the law to be able to access um, safe and legal abortion. And the other thing I want to speak about is essentially um, challenging non-compliance with court orders. Um, I want to draw your attention to one of the progressive cases that was determined by the High Court of Kenya, that actually the center litigated on behalf of the Federation of Women Lawyers uh, in Kenya and three other uh, advocates that is, one of them is actually an adolescent girl. She's commonly known or famously known as JMM. JMM was a 14 year old girl who was sexually abused. Um, she didn't get the appropriate uh, um, care when she procured unsafe abortion. And therefore this led to um, long life um, complications and this essentially led to her death. 
um, and we challenge the court, uh, we challenge the government of Kenya for failure to implement, uh, to the to implement and the withdrawal of the standard and guidelines on reducing maternal mortality and morbidity due to unsafe abortion in Kenya. What this meant that was that because of withdrawal of this standard and guidelines, women were not getting in, uh, uh, appropriate information around um, safe and legal abortion. Health providers created a confusion around health providers being able to provide this service, and essentially women were not able to access services. And therefore, after this ruling, one year later, we are still seeing the government not being able to provide, uh, to implement this court decision. We are still uh, seeing women being um, arrested. We are still seeing women being uh, 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 harassed. We are still seeing a rise in opposition because one is that government has failed to comply with court orders that actually say that uh, abortion has to be provided as it is provided within the law. And therefore, the reinstatement of standard and guidelines have to be a priority uh, for the government of Kenya. So in a nutshell, we decriminalize, we create awareness that women are able to know that this is a right that they have to enjoy. And um, we have to, um, to hold government accountable for non-compliance with cold orders. And of course, continue uh, the, the tackling the opposition, the rise of opposition, which is actually attacking um, women rights in general, but specifically issues of sexual and reproductive rights, specifically abortion. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, the last question for today uh, to our outstanding panelist goes to Mr. Levi Singh. Uh, speaking about uh, the last question, this basically has to do with the um, activities and the strategy of the United Nations aid in promoting SRHR in Africa. UNAIDS is one of the uh, international NGOs working to promote uh, reproductive health and rights in Africa. Speaking of other opportunities, Dr. Rupadat has been sharing a lot of links on the chat section for opportunities for we students and also ways we can enlighten ourselves more on reproductive health and rights. Now, speaking to us about the strategies of UNAIDS in promoting SRHR in Africa, within a wrap of two to three minutes, Mr. Ilevatin. Thank you. But Mr. Moderator, uh, I think colleagues uh, spoke a lot more eloquently. I think Stella touched on the importance of, of key populations and the most vulnerable, uh, how they are most um, affected by uh, new HIV infections. And I think that uh, just a few days ago, it was World AIDS Day and the UNAIDS put out a report and indicated that around 54% of new HIV infections globally were found, um, were found amongst key population groups. So this just goes on to show that um, key population groups are amongst the most left behind. And in the African context, we usually uh, do include adolescent girls and young women and adolescents more broadly into that, uh, that definition of key population simply due to the level of risk they are exposed to epidemiologically, but also in, in, in society. Um, I, I think to, to be fair, we have to um, we have to use this moment of the new UN aid strategy to galvanize a sense of urgency that seems to have been lost over the last decade. And when I talk about a sense of urgency, I think that we need to be quite blatant about the fact that AIDS remains the single leading cause of death of African adolescents across the continent. We lose um, conservative estimates put it to say that we lose around one adolescent and young person every 45 minutes somewhere across the continent to an AIDS-related illness, which is a completely preventable illness. Um, in other regions of the world, it's uh, usually uh, mortality associated with um, road traffic accidents or, uh, or mental health uh, issues such as, uh, or resulting in, in suicide. But on the African continent, it is something that is completely preventable and we, we don't necessarily see much political will or um, any increased resources from our member states in terms of tackling this, this pandemic. And I think the, the premise of, of ensuring that this new UNAID strategy is youth focused and, and future focused is to basically say that if we continue on this trajectory for the next 10 years, we are profoundly impacting our potential as the African continent to realize our demographic dividend because 
fundamentally, if we are losing our future workforce hour by hour, day by day, year by year, we are putting ourselves in an incredibly compromising position. And uh, I, I would urge all colleagues and all interested parties on this uh, on the, to uh, definitely follow the developments around the UNH strategy and how we can use it as an instrument over the next 10 years to influence better SRHR outcomes for adolescents and young people across the continent. Thank you so much, Mr. Levi Singh. Uh, it's actually very wonderful to have someone from the SRHR African Trust. They're the people we entrust with our sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa. As we come to the end of this lovely session, uh, there are two questions in the chat box, both of which have been answered at some point or the other. And the um, last question concerning uh, the influence of religions and religion in policy, and if uh, each country is not allowed to make its policy based on the social and religious acceptability of that nation, has been answered by Dr. Rupata. Uh, now, this is the point where we give our closing remarks. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we, there's one thing we've taken away from this uh, session is the fact that SRHR is a very important part of um, reproductive health and rights in Africa. Uh, SRHR is a very important part of um, health care in Africa. And the fact that Africa does not take it very, very seriously is really um, selling to a very large extent on the general health in Africa, moving from the uh, oppression of the minority sex group, the LGBTQ community, to uh, the absence of gender equity in carrying out activities, making of policies and health care or reproductive rights for women, uh, and the other challenges we experience. We, it's important that Africa needs to wake up. And hence, we health students are now the ones that have been surmounted with the responsibility to carry on the mantle of advocacy in sexual reproductive health and rights. Hence, as their closing remarks, each of our panelists is going to take one minute giving we health students an advice on how to promote SRHR in Africa and in our nation. And this is the closing remark to which we'll be known by. To begin, Dr. Daddy, please, you may have the floor. A one minute closing remark and advice to health students. Thank you. Okay, seems uh, Dr. Daggy is experiencing a little bit of technical issues. So to our next panelist, please, uh, Dr. Rupadat, can you please give us a closing remark and a message to health students in a minute? Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, really simple message today here is that you are the leaders of today, and especially young people in Africa are uh, the majority, and, and they are doing very amazing stuff. So I feel like I don't have anything else to add to what you're already doing, but really say, uh, really think about women in global health as a partner to support your advocacy. Uh, very rich discussions that took place today. I think there's a need to continue to have these discussions. These are not easy discussions. They um, require us talking about some tough issues. And um, today, uh, I really thank all of our uh, fellow uh, co-panelists who really brought up the, the these very tough issues around the spectrum of gender, the spectrum of sexuality, the spectrum of women's rights, um, and how that intersects with religion and other sociocultural practices. And these um, things we need to continue to discuss. So one, continue to really be aware and participate in these discussions, um, create spaces to really have brave discussions on these issues, to be inspired and continue to inspire each other and count on global partners, um, uh, count on local partners to really um, be a, a, a place of uh, collective action and really drive third uh, social change for a more sustainable and equitable inclusive world for all people. And let's not really see the discussions that we're having today as a gender war, but truly um, a conversation for advancing everyone's human rights. So thank you and turning it back to you, Daniel. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupadat the amazing CEO and co-founder, Women in Global Health. To um, 
Miss Miriam, would you please give us a one minute closing remark and message to health students on sex reproductive health and rights? Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you so much for having me. Um, my closing remarks, reproductive rights are human rights, uh, and that is where we begin. And how can students contribute doing exactly what you're doing? You are essentially disruptors. You are in a generation, a very different generation that can be extremely excellent disruptors. And I think you're already doing this by holding this kind of conversation. Speak out about SRHR. Um, speak about the issues that essentially make um, SRHR and especially issues around abortion to be um, an issue that is considered not to be discussed. And join the movement of uh, reproductive rights uh, advocates. We have spaces to do this. We build capacities. Uh, we build champions as well. So speak out, speak out, speak out. Be disruptors. Thank you so very much. Our message from Ms. Miriam is speak out. Our message from Dr. Rupert is you are the leaders of today and tomorrow. Now to our amazing Dr. Busire, our iron lady, our lady on fire, and our advocate, our social legal OMG. No. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, I, I have gained a new heart called the Iron Lady. So I'm going to, to crown myself with so much pride. Um, Thank you. For me, this is, this is my closing remark. Every time right now, the whole world is talking about UHC universal health coverage. Remember the three tenets of UHC? Equality, quality, and financial. Um, a protection from an, for a catastrophic financial expenditure. So how is it that we can be able to leverage on these spaces that exist to be able to bring out the SRHR needs for young people and also the population at, her, at, at large? That we have to always have an intersectional lens, the human being. Medical students, I will tell you this, and people who are doing healthcare, I will tell you this. The family social history is a very important component of the medical history of a patient. Why? Because it picks out issues around livelihood. It picks out issues around access to clean water. It picks out issues around access to justice because those are important tenants that need to be able to interrogate it in the social determinants of health. Never ever look at a patient from a single lens. Always have a multiplicity lens in which you're looking at, in which you're looking at your patient. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us to grace your amazing occasion. And it's been a pleasure. I brought my activism on. Of course, you had that. And I'm looking forward to working <laughs> with you guys in the next time possible, as, as the universe will allow. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. We will be inviting you for our one week session on SRHR as proposed. <laughs> Okay, now moving to our representative from the SRHR African Trust, Mr. Eleva Singh. Please, what's your message for We Health students and what's your closing remark? A minute, please. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Facilitator. Um, three simple ones. Always remember, all help for all people, all of the time, uh, without distinction of any kind. Uh, and it, it really comes down to understanding that this new normal, uh, which everyone is very excited about, cannot um, pr profoundly affect the future trajectory of the world if young people aren't at the center of creating a post-pandemic world actively. So for us, I would say that this new normal shouldn't just be a new normal, but new necessary, where we take up space, where we lead by example, and where we uh, embody ethical and principled leadership that truly leaves no one behind and is responsive to the needs of the communities that we serve. So uh, in, in, in saying that, I think we should always ask ourselves four questions. Uh, who are we talking to? Who are we listening to? Who are we including? And who are we taking with as we move forward in, in improving uh, the cause of social justice for our constituents and the communities we serve at large? Thank you and uh, congratulations to you all for pulling off this fabulous event. Thank you so much, Mr. Levi Singh. And finally, to our amazing Dr. Jacob Chulwi, uh, can you please give us a message to We Health students and your closing remark in a minute? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Daniel. And uh, to our students, thank you so much for your time and uh, in listening to our discussions. 
just to re-echo that sexual reproductive health rights as has indica been indicated is a human right. And it's a human right which encompasses a lot of issues that most times affect young people, including medical students. And so because it, it, it encompasses issues that concern us, we are saying for my for my last key message, I'm saying, let's contribute, let's engage and discuss and raise voices that over issues that concern us. And I want to say that opportunities are there to contribute and to engage. Platforms are there and has, has been demonstrated from the Women in Global Health Zambia, including Women in Global Health, the global from Dr. Rupa, we are saying platforms are there and we open to provide space and platforms for you to, to, to raise your voices and contribute to issues and make noise and make as much noise as possible to hold our governments and stakeholders accountable to all the promises that they make towards our own health rights as young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob Chowri. Um, okay, so don't forget, please, sexual reproductive health and rights, as my colleague and senior colleague, Dr. Mary Claire Wangari, is the backbone of healthcare in Africa. Our uh, amiable panelists have given us some of their contacts and emails on the chat box if you want to reach out to any of them. For those who want to become activists in SRHR, I don't have to announce it. Hold on to the garments of Dr. Stella Busiri and Dr. Rupada. For those who want to keep promoting the fight, the fight for the LGBTQ community, please hold on to Dr. Miriam, Dr. Busiri, and Dr. Rupada. For those who want to promote um, gender equity, Dr. Rupada is the person to go. If you are very, very concerned about generally sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa and how to improve it, please kindly reach out to Dr. Jacob and Mr. Levi Singh. We've um, come to the end of this amazing, wonderful session. And uh, there are so many things to actually talk about on the SRHR and uh, two hours is obviously not sufficient, but we dealt with the best we could on the challenges in Africa on sexual reproductive health and rights. At this moment, I think uh, I will call it a day and I will invite uh, my fellow OC to round up the session. Thank you. Um, hello everyone. Thank you very much for, it was really, really an engaging and mind-blowing session. We can attest, all the participants can attest to that. Um, our speakers are really, really passionate and really active about sexual reproductive rights. And we are really happy to have had, we had the honor to host them on the session. And we're thankful to all of you. And day two of AHES is ending. Join us tomorrow for the final day of the summit and together we can make your universal health coverage, sexual reproductive rights and gender equality to be a thing, a norm in Africa. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much everyone. Uh, will be coming officially to the end of this session, the session on sexual reproductive health and rights in Africa and the role of youth in promoting this. Please join us tomorrow for our amazing sessions on healthcare financing and the agenda 2063 of the African Union. This morning, uh, the speaker, the nursing, national nursing president from Nigeria asked on agenda 2063. If you want to know more about that, please join us tomorrow very wonderful panelists to speak about that and healthcare financing in Africa. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.
goodbye from us here at the organizing committee as I have. Uh, thank you so much, our dear panelists. Au revoir.